Okay, I propose to start. So uh, again, good morning to everyone. I hope you had a nice Easter time. My name is Klaus Blaum from the Max Planck Institute for Nuclear Physics in Heidelberg. I'm the, today's uh, chair of the fifth seminar in the series of our webinar on precision physics and fundamental symmetry. It's my great pleasure to introduce today our speaker, Professor Dr. Pete Schmidt. He is the head of the Quest Institute for Experimental Quantum Metrology at the German Institute for Metrology, the PDB in Braunschweig. At the same time, Pete is full professor at the University of Hannover. Pete's research is in the focus of the topic of our webinar series, and he's a true expert in precision measurements using quantum optics techniques. So we are very happy of having him today as our speaker on quantum logic spectroscopy of highly charged ions for optical clocks and tests of fundamental physics. So have fun, and Pete, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Klaus, for the kind introduction, and also to you, uh, Stefan and Christian, for organizing this uh, virtual seminar. It's a great pleasure to be here, and uh, uh, here means, in this case, uh, actually uh, PTB in Braunschweig. Uh, I'm sitting somewhere right here uh, in this tower uh, on the beautiful Braunschweig campus of uh, PDB. And for those of you who don't know PDB, uh, PDB is Germany's National Metrology Institute. Uh, it's the oldest metrology institute um, and it has a number of legal tasks, for example, determination of fundamental constants and in particular dissemination of the SI units, but also to develop new measurement techniques to realize the SI units better and better. And as such, uh, we have a lot of PhD students, so we do a lot of research uh, and have uh, more than 600 publications per year. Now, um, in my group, uh, everything revolves around uh, quantum logic spectroscopy. Um, we build an aluminum uh, ion clock. Uh, we are starting to set up a calcium multi-ion clock. Uh, we perform spectroscopy on complex ions, on molecular ions, and we do quantum engineering. Uh, to enhance the sensitivity of our measurements. And all this uh, we do to access uh, previously inaccessible systems that have uh, interesting spectroscopic uh, properties, uh, perform spectroscopy on them with high resolution and accuracy for applications in astronomy, relativistic geodesy, for example, height measurements with clocks, but also fundamental physics. And what I'll be talking about today uh, is the topic on top here, uh, which is the uh, highly charged ion project. Now, um, you've uh, seen this already in some of the previous uh, talks of this uh, virtual seminar series. Um, there are a number of very important open questions in physics. For example, we don't know how to unite gravity with the other fundamental forces because we don't know how to build a quantum field theory of gravity. We also don't know what most of the universe is composed of because we don't know what dark matter and dark energy are. And uh, Dima Butke, for example, has already alluded on uh, dark energy in, in his talk uh, in, in a lot of detail. And we don't know uh, why we're even here uh, because we cannot explain the surplus in, ob in observed matter over antimatter in the universe. And uh, if you look at these uh, grand challenges in physics, um, you think, or and I think that's true, you will find answers in cosmology as well as in high energy physics. But uh, what this seminar series is all about is the low energy, extremely high resolution regime where we can use quantum optics techniques and metrology to perform high resolution spectroscopic measurements to find deviations from predictions of the standard model that might hint uh, to some of these, uh, to answers to some of these questions here. Now, what uh, could that, for example, be? And these are just uh, a few selected topics. There are many more of those, uh, which you will hear more about in the subsequent uh, lecture series as well. Um, there's, for example, the variation of fundamental constants, um, for example, the fine structure constant alpha. Um, there uh, you can perform tests of relativity by uh, frequency comparisons of clocks, for example. Um, you can uh, probe for fifth forces, additional forces that couple, for example, electrons to neutrons in uh, nuclei. Um, and of course, we can perform tests of quantum electrodynamics theory. 
And uh, the reason why I've selected these four examples uh, is because highly charged ions are extremely sensitive probes uh, to these uh, physical effects. And uh, by performing high resolution spectroscopy, we can uh, address those effects. Now, um, in my talk, I will provide you with a brief introduction to highly charged ions. I will then show you what the current state of the art uh, or the previous state of the art in spectroscopy of highly charged ions is. Um, I will show you our experimental setup um, where we have teamed up with the MPIK in Heidelberg in Jose Crespo's group uh, to set up an uh, electron beam ion trap and a cryogenic pore trap uh, where we can uh, store highly charged ions. We can slow them sympathetic, uh, sympathetically cool them to the ground state of motion uh, and then perform quantum logic spectroscopy on them. I will show you first results and uh, what's up next uh, in our project. Now, um, some of you may not be familiar with the physics of highly charged ions, so let me just give you a feeling of the scaling of the energy scales in highly charged ions. Uh, when you move from a neutral hydrogen atom, for example, to um, a hydrogen like uranium ion, uh, the binding energy scales as the atomic number to the uh, second power. That means the binding energy of the last electron is about about 140 kilo electrons in this case. A hyperfine splitting uh, goes from microelectron volts uh, to electron volts. That's in the visible regime. Uh, QED effects scale as well from microelectron volts to 300 electron volts because uh, they exhibit even stronger scaling than the hyperfine splitting. In turn, uh, other effects like, for example, uh, polarizability or Stark effects are strongly suppressed. Uh, simply because uh, the, um, the radius of the remaining electron um, uh, cloud or uh, distribution around the nucleus is extremely tiny because of the strong uh, Kuhner interaction and therefore polarizability is extremely slow, uh, small. Now, uh, to give you a specific example, uh, let's have a look at the uh, highly charged ion species that uh, we have investigated, uh, which is argon-13+. Argon-13+, has the electronic structure of neutral boron. And in boron, there's um, a, a dipole allowed transition between the P1 half and the S1 half state that is at 250 nanometers. In argon 13 plus, that transition is now at 19 nanometers and therefore inaccessible for uh, laser spectroscopy. Um, in contrast, the fine structure splitting of the ground state, the P1 half, P3 half splitting, uh, that's a few hundred uh, gigahertz actually um, in the uh, neutral boron is now at 441 nanometers and well within the range of optical spectroscopy. Now uh, that's just one example where you can uh, find optical transitions in highly charged ions. As if you go to a higher charge state, you can also find hyperfine structure um, uh, transitions that are in the optical regime and there's a third possibility, which is level crossings. And how do the level crossings come about? Um, it's when you go from a, a neutral atom, you will have the Madelung ordering, uh, where the ordering is according to the number of nodes in the electronic wave function. And that uh, is given by, by this ordering here. Whereas if you go to hydrogen-like systems, then you fill one shell after the other. So the uh, four the, the 4F shell is filled before the 5S shell, for example. Um, and whereas this is different, there's a different ordering if you go to the, to the, neutral, um, to the neutral atom in the many electron system. As a consequence, as a, uh, as a function of the charge state, uh, in this case here, uh, you get level crossings of different orbitals. And near those level crossings, despite the fact that the energy uh, level here is hundreds of electron volts, um, near those level crossings, you can have optical transitions in the electron uh, board regime that you can uh, use for precision spectroscopy experiments. And those level crossing transitions are actually the most interesting one uh, for a number of uh, these fundamental physics tests that I will be talking about. Okay, now uh, highly charged ions uh, have actually been around since the uh, beginning of the universe. They are very abundant in the universe because near suns, 
uh, all matter is essentially, uh, of course, in, in highly charged form. Um, and therefore, they have been used uh, very early on as probes for cosmic or, and stellar processes, in particular near suns. And here you can see a picture um, of the magnetic field lines of uh, our sun uh, in a solar eclipse. Of course, this is a false color image. Um, they've also been used uh, for similar reasons as probes uh, for uh, plasma physics. So here you can deduce from the distribution of charge state of tungsten the electron temperature in the plasma, for example. Uh, what uh, many people are probably not aware of is that uh, the next generation of your computer or cell phone would not be possible with high, without highly charged ions because the source in the uh, semiconductor FAP, the, the wafer uh, stepper that does the exposure of the photoresist uh, is actually operating um, at 13.5 nanometers, which is uh, produced uh, by highly charged tin droplets. And there's, a, the, there's essentially a UV source uh, that uh, emits uh, tin, highly charged tin droplets at the rate of 100 kilohertz. Um, and then uh, the light uh, that's, uh, that is shown here is getting imaged onto the wafer uh, for high resolution um, uh, semiconductor fans in photolithography. Okay, but these are not the things that we are interested in. We are interested in highly charged ions because they uh, exhibit a very simple electronic structure and therefore they can serve as a test bed for atomic structure theory because we can calculate uh, small electronic systems with up initial um, uh, calculation techniques. Uh, they can also be used uh, to perform uh, QED tests, for example, uh, by measuring G factors um, um, in highly charged ions. That, uh, that's a, a, a QED test in the high field uh, regime. Um, and I think maybe Klaus is going to talk about this um, in, in his presentation. Um, Highly charged ions are also sensitive uh, to a variation in fundamental constants. And uh, what happens if, uh, uh, for example, the fine structure constant alpha changes, then the level structure of your favorite atom uh, will change. And we can use that change in a frequency comparison to deduce um, an upper bound on a possible variation of, of alpha. Uh, they're also very sensitive uh, to a violation of local Lorentz invariance, uh, testing uh, Einstein's equivalence principles, one of the pillars of general relativity, uh, because relativistic effects are strongly enhanced in highly charged ions. We can also measure these uh, isotope shifts, uh, probing for fifth forces uh, that I will be talking about um, towards the end of my talk. And you can use um, highly charged ions uh, to measure parity violations, for example, in XUV transitions. And of course, uh, they're a very sensitive probe for all kinds of nuclear physics, simply because the, the electron that we talk to in spectroscopy is uh, very close to the nucleus, and therefore we can probe nuclear structure by performing electron spectroscopy um, on highly charged ions. Okay, now, um, one example that I uh, would like to give you is the variation of fundamental constants, for example, the fine structure constant. If the fine structure constant changes, then the different uh, ions and atoms will uh, experience a different change in their level structure. And that change is given by a sensitivity coefficient k that relates a relative change in the fine structure constant to a relative change in the transition frequency. And we can calculate that uh, coefficient, that sensitivity coefficient with, uh, with very high accuracy using um, up initial atomic structure theory. Now, how do we measure such a thing? Uh, so the one way is to build two optical clocks that are based on two different transitions with um, a very large difference in their sensitivity coefficient. And we can then uh, compare those two clocks and uh, derive an upper bound. And uh, one of the reasons why alpha might actually change, uh, Dima Butke has explained uh, in his talk, one of the examples is that uh, you can have a coupling to dark matter uh, of your electronic uh, structure, and that would appear as uh, a change in the fine structure constant. Okay, how uh, do these uh, clock comparisons look like? Um, 
they have been performed uh, with uh, typical optical clocks like strontium uh, neutral atom uh, clock and then terbium, mercury and aluminum ion clocks with uh, different sensitivity coefficients. Um, and uh, this is a, a preliminary result that I think is uh, uh, already outdated. Uh, that has been uh, compiled by my colleagues Eka Pike and uh, Christian Listert. Um, and you can see here this white ellipse is the still allowed uh, one sigma region um, where alpha uh, that is plotted here and uh, the electron to proton mass ratio are a relative change uh, on the vertical axis. And, uh, the allowed uh, parameter regime for a variation is, is, is inside here. Um, now, if you look at these um, sensitivity coefficients, you can see that there are single digit numbers, essentially. Um, and of course, what you can do to narrow this wide region further down is you can uh, go to better clocks, uh, essentially do better clock comparisons, or you can uh, start selecting species that have a larger k value here. And there's a number uh, of uh, highly charged ion species in particular that exhibit uh, very large, uh, like almost 10 times or uh, more than 10 times larger sensitivity coefficients in different transitions with different signs even. Um, and uh, that is one of our motivations to investigate highly charged ions, to turn them into optical clocks and uh, perform measurements such as this one uh, just with a, a much larger sensitivity here. Okay, and why is that uh, the case that uh, highly charged ions are so much more sensitive? The reason is again that we have very strong relativistic effects and we have large ionization uh, energies and both of these effects can be shown to contribute to the very strong uh, sensitivity to a change in alpha. Um, now, what you need to have, um, and what has been selected here already, is uh, you need to have transitions between different electronic configurations. Uh, and these are exclusively optical transitions near level crossings. Only those will exhibit these large um, enhancement factors here. Uh, on the other hand, hyperfine transitions uh, can, that are in the optical regime in this case, can be sensitive or are typically sensitive to a change in the electron to proton mass ratio. Um, and uh, those measure, uh, those uh, limits have been obtained um, up to now by comparing to cesium fountain clocks. And the advantage of using highly charged ions here is that we have optical transitions and therefore can average down much quicker than would be uh, available with, with comparisons with cesium fountain clocks, for example. Okay, now, um, the, the next uh, puzzle we have to solve is, um, are highly charged ions actually uh, suitable uh, as optical clocks? And um, if you look at the requirements for optical clocks, you want high accuracy. That means we want to have low sensitivity uh, to resonance inducing shifts. Um, and that's uh, predominantly electric and magnetic fields, uh, for example. Uh, there's, of course, um, uh, other shifts like uh, Doppler shifts um, that you have to take care of and uh, with ions also micromotion shifts. Now, uh, the periodic table, of course, is full of uh, neutral and uh, singly charged ions that have uh, already been turned into clocks. And a natural question is, um, uh, is there an advantage in using highly charged ions over these species, except for the high sensitivity to fundamental physics? And uh, yes, there can be. Um, uh, some of these uh, external field shifts are suppressed in highly charged ions. And uh, that has to do with the small size of the electronic clouds. For example, the linear Stark shift is suppressed as 1 over z. Uh, the second order or dynamic Stark shift is uh, suppressed by 1 over the fourth power uh, of the atomic number. Uh, linear Siemens shifts are similar to neutral atom and single charged ions. Uh, second order Siemens shifts uh, can be suppressed. Um, uh, for uh, in the absence of um, hyperfine splitting, for example, um, and electric quadrupole shifts and other shifts uh, that is relevant for ion-based optical clocks is also typically suppressed. Okay, so that looks like uh, we can actually turn highly charged ions into clocks. Now, looks uh, let's look at uh, a more specific wish list of what we want to have. 
um, to build a high accuracy, high stability optical clock. Uh, we want a narrow transition, and that exists in highly charged ions. We want uh, the clock transition to be in a laser accessible range between 200 nanometers and 2 microns. That exists. Uh, we want uh, the intrinsic atomic uh, properties of highly charged ions to be similar or uh, better than uh, the currently best systems, uh, which is currently the aluminum ion clock and the ytterbium uh, octopole clock, and also that exists. And uh, we want to have a sparse and simple level structure to simplify uh, initial state preparation and laser complexity, and also that exists in highly charged ions. We want the species or the isotope to be long-lived uh, that we have. Uh, unfortunately, all these uh, requirements are not yet all found in one species. Uh, but since the periodic table is large and there's a large number of highly charged ions, I'm, uh, I'm very optimistic um, that we will identify a highly charged ion that um, uh, can address all these features at the same time. Now, just to give you an idea, there's a large body of literature on uh, turning highly charged ions into um, uh, uh, optical clocks. Um, what uh, one can see uh, if we, you look through the paper is that not all properties are known. So we need more atomic and spectroscopic data um, uh, in, uh, where the properties have been calculated related uncertainties in the clock, systematic uncertainties below 10 to the minus 18 have been proposed. Okay, now uh, with those bold claims, uh, you uh, certainly want to know where state of the art of um, highly charged ion spectroscopy actually is. Now um, for this you can have a look at the NIST atomic uh, spectral database. Uh, and extract all uh, highly charged ion data that is available there, um, uh, and or, or all neutral and, and highly charged ion data that is available. And you get a plot like this, where here is the nuclear charge, uh, here is the number of electrons, and typically uh, our research uh, evolves along the diagonal and one below that marks neutral and singly charged atoms. Now there. Uh, doubly and triply charged uh, information um, available for some of the species, but the most of the data here uh, that uh, indicates the highly charged ion regime, um, it's, it's a blank void. So we do not know much about it except for these scattered data points. And I should mention that what is not included here is uh, accelerator, uh, 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 data from um, accelerator experiments. Uh, that has not found its way yet into the NIST atomic uh, database. Now, how are these data points uh, typically taken? Um, they have been taken by uh, producing highly charged ions in the plasma, in a so-called electron beam ion trap, and what that is, I'll explain in a minute, um, and uh, collecting the uh, fluorescing light from those uh, EBITs and uh, putting it into a grating spectrometer, and then you can see uh, spectra like this, where here is the wavelength in uh, nanometers, and that's argon 30 plus in this case. Um, the EBIT works at a uh, high magnetic field, that's why the fine structure components here uh, are largely split um, in, in the uh, fraction of the nanometer regime. Um, and the uh, typical width of these resonances is on the order of uh, 45 gigahertz. And that's purely Doppler uh, broadened because the temperature in these uh, EBITs is a plasma. It's millions of Kelvins, essentially. Um, and uh, you can determine the center uh, of, of these resonances here with a resolution of about 150 megahertz. So that's uh, purely Doppler limited in, the, in this case. OK. Now, in contrast to that, um, we can trap singly charged uh, ions or maybe even uh, or other charge state of ions in uh, so-called pole traps. Uh, these are linear pole traps, and you've heard those about those in uh, Christian Osbekaus's talk already. You apply RF here in this Innsbruck-style ion trap uh, to the blades um, to provide radio confinement. We apply the DC potential to the end caps to provide axial confinement. And overall, we have a 3D harmonic confinement uh, to the ion that are uh, inside the trapping region here, which is on the order of, uh, of, of a millimeter or so. 
We achieve uh, trapping frequencies on the order of a few megahertz uh, that allows us to perform recall free absorption, uh, which is important for high resolution spectroscopy. We can also have very long interrogation times because we trap the ions uh, for hours at a time uh, or even days or months uh, for some other uh, ion species. We trap the ion near the zero field uh, of the trapping potential here, and therefore we have only very small trap impute strings. Uh, we can also apply laser cooling, and the fact that there's no other interactions except for the cooler interaction, which does not modify the transition energies, um, uh, except for, for gradients, electric field gradients that lead to a quadrupole shift, we can uh, have extremely high accuracies, um, as for example indicated by uh, the Iterbium uh, single ion octopole clock um, that ha has been evaluated uh, in the meantime now to uh, about three times simple minus 18 and is operated um, in the laboratory next to our building um, uh, of my, uh, in the group of uh, Eckhart Pike and Nils Huntemann here at PTB. Okay, now wh where, where is this huge discrepancy coming from uh, between the resolution in highly charged ions and in uh, singly charged ion plots? Uh, the reason is that uh, for highly charged ions, we typically have no fast cycling transition for state preparation, cooling, and detection of the internal state after spectroscopy. Um, uh, and that is not available um, with, with highly charged ions. And this is where the a huge discrepancy in the uncertainty uh, for laser spectroscopy comes from. And now what uh, we um, want to do and have demonstrated is that you can uh, bring highly charged uh, ion spectroscopy to the level of single charged atomic ions using quantum logic spectroscopy in which you trap um, uh, a lot so-called logic or cooling ion together with your uh, spectroscopy ion uh, inside a linear fault trap. And uh, how does that come about? Uh, for example, this is our uh, highly charged ion uh, together with our beryllium logic ion and um, we can do spectroscopy now uh, on the highly charged ion and then through a series of laser pulses we can transfer the internal state of the spectroscopy ion um, onto the beryllium logic ion and there we can detect it. And uh, that all works because of the strong cooler interaction uh, between the two ions and the shared common motional mode, as, as I will show you later. Now, uh, the beryllium logic ion also provides sympathetic cooling and signal readout, and you can uh, uh, you can uh, use you can see that system as a composite system that uh, combines the advantages of both ion species and uh, allows us to investigate uh, previously inaccessible highly charged ions with high accuracy. Highly charged ion spectroscopy is not the only uh, thing that you can do. Um, you may have heard that the most, uh, the currently most accurate clock, the aluminum uh, ion clock operated at uh, NIST uh, in Boulder, um, is also using quantum logic spectroscopy techniques and um, uh, the NIST group and, and uh, our group and, and others, um, for example, Stefan Village has recently uh, also uh, published a paper on molecular ion state detection and preparation using these uh, quantum logic techniques. Okay, now uh, using beryllium as a, a sympathetic uh, cooling uh, or uh, using beryllium um, uh, is not restricted to uh, using it as a logic ion, but also um, it can act as a, a cell energy booster, uh, which improves the effectiveness of our treatments. And I think I can co-sign that statement because without beryllium, we would not be able to uh, perform highly charged ion spectroscopy. Now, um, the setup uh, that uh, we have built together with uh, Jose Crespo at the MPIK in Heidelberg uh, consists of a cryogenic beam line where we use uh, a closed cycle pulse tube um, and then conduct the heat away from our trapping chamber here. Uh, there's a 4K stage. Um, and uh, a 40k stage, that is the outer cylinder here. Um, uh, we have vibration decoupling in this system uh, using these uh, woven copper uh, meshes, um, and such that the pendulum here is essentially freely oscillating between the trapping chamber and the pulse tube. And this way we could reduce the vibration uh, measured uh, here in trapping region from 8 microns to below 20 nanometers. 
Um, the trapping chamber um, also uh, is surrounded by a lot of copper. That means we have intrinsic shielding um, of um, magnetic fields uh, down to the Pico Tesla, hundreds of Pico Tesla uh, regime essentially here. Um, we um, have an ion, a linear ion trap, um, uh, which is in our case a segmented blade trap. It's made from um, alumina, which is gold coated and laser structured. It features five segments and uh, 0.7 millimeter ion to electron distance. We achieve trapping frequencies on the order of two megahertz and heating rates um, at four Kelvin of on the order of one quanta per second. Uh, we have an imaging uh, system uh, with a single biaspheric lens with an F number of about one. Um, that's a cat drawing here uh, with the imaging lens where we can adjust the, 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 the focus position and where we can have uh, highly charged ions uh, inject here into the uh, linear power track. And this is how uh, the thing looks in reality. Um, uh, it's all gold coated uh, to, uh, to um, uh, suppress black body radiation coupling uh, to the environment. This is all put in to um, a vacuum chamber with a 4K shield here um, and a, a 40K shield um, and all of that is in a, in a, in a vacuum uh, out here and it's uh, hold by a spokes, a spokes system to keep it in place and also to keep it centered uh, via cooling and, and warm up. Uh, now the electron beam ion trap is uh, that we have as our source here um, works in the following way. It's a compact uh, 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 EBIT that has been uh, designed and built by uh, Jose Crespo's group at the MPRK in Heidelberg. Um, we start here with an electron gun where um, an electron beam is generated, accelerated towards a collector here. Um, and we use a magnetic field that is generated by permanent magnets. Uh, to uh, focus the electron beam down here in the center to a few hundred microns um, in diameter and a few millimeters in length. We can then uh, inject um, uh, the uh, argon gas here that gets ionized via this uh, electron beam and uh, is trapped. The highly charged argon uh, beams uh, uh, ions are then trapped here in the space charge of the um, electron beam um, in, inside uh, the trapping region here. And what you can see here, this is a, 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 just a camera picture um, with a, taken with a cell phone. Uh, here you can see the, the uh, argon 13 plus line at 441 nanometers. You can adjust the current um, and the energy uh, to select to, to sort of enhance the production of argon 13 plus ions. Uh, in this uh, region here. Okay, the temperature uh, is given in totally the wrong units uh, inside this plasma, uh, namely electron volts. Uh, it's about 100 electron volts or more um, once you switch off the electron beam, uh, and that's uh, about a million Kelvin or so. We can then uh, apply a voltage to eject the highly charged ions and uh, um, uh, slow them down in the, in the beam line. This is how the actual system looks like uh, without uh, the electron gun uh, that is attached to, to one end and uh, retractable, but you can see the yokes here and the, um, the mounts for the uh, permanent magnets that we use here. Now this entire system um, is set up in two rooms. We have a gray room uh, or a machine room where we have all the noisy um, and uh, uh, more dirty stuff, for example, the uh, a closed cycle cryostat here. Uh, the supply line that I've introduced to you already. Also, the EBIT is located here in this gray room. Um, and uh, we can uh, eject the uh, highly charged ions here. They fly around the corner. Uh, we have a time of flight selector, and then we can inject them here into our uh, cryogenic pore trap, um, where we typically have a pre cooled cloud, a laser cooled cloud of beryllium ions, and then uh, we can insert and sympathetically cool the argon 13 plus in here. Now, how does this um, um, uh, slowing and selection procedure actually work? We breed um, a charge distribution around the argon 13 plus in here. Uh, then we can apply a potential to eject the highly charged ions. 
they separate uh, in a time of flight depending on their charge state and we can pulse an electron, uh, electron down here to selectively have argon 13 plus enter the slowing region where uh, the argon ions uh, climb up a hill uh, where they that we pulse down once they are in the center of the hill and they lose energy and their um, their temperature is reduced at the same time because uh, highly energetic ions uh, climb further up than lower energy ions and therefore we also get cooling in this case. Uh, in the last step, um, we have the highly charged ions uh, climb a residual um, step of about 100 electron volts per charge um, and then they enter uh, the ion trap. And that uh, uh, is shown here. Um, we have here a pre-cooled crystal of beryllium ions sitting in, uh, uh, this, um, uh, in this trapping region. Once the highly charged ions enter, we ramp up a mirror electrode such that the highly charged ions um, um, oscillate back and forth and can interact with this uh, beryllium ion crystal. And if they have interacted enough, um, they crystallize eventually, that, uh, which is seen as a dark void appearing in this uh, beryllium uh, ion crystal. Now, um, to perform quantum logic spectroscopy, uh, we need to reduce uh, this large cloud of beryllium ions to one argon 13 plus and one beryllium ions and uh, beryllium ion. And we do that by parametric heating uh, of the beryllium ion um, until we get uh, this situation here. Now, the total preparation time um, of this uh, two ion crystal uh, is on the order of a few minutes and uh, our current lifetime, sort of average lifetime of the argon 13 plus is at about uh, 14 minutes in our system, hinting towards a residual background gas pressure of uh, 10 to the minus 14 millibar, just assuming, assuming Langevin collisions. And um, we're preparing for an upgrade of the system uh, to insert windows to all the holes towards room temperature uh, to further reduce the pressure and enhance our lifetimes. Uh, but in any case, uh, this is already, uh, this ratio of preparation time over lifetime is very favorable uh, to do sensible experiments. Okay, now, um, how do we do the quantum logic part um, with the highly charged ion? And um, Christian Osmikhaus has already given a seminar about uh, quantum logic, so I will be very brief here. The original idea uh, dates back uh, to Ignacio Zirac and Peter Soller, who proposed to use the normal mode structure um, or the shared normal mode of ions uh, in a linear ion trap uh, to transport quantum information and mediate trans uh, quantum information between the two ions. And it was Dave Weiland who actually suggested to um, use these types of techniques and uh, methods uh, to perform precision spectroscopy. And uh, he's the, the founder, of, founding father of quantum logic spectroscopy. Now, um, how does the system look like? Uh, we have here our favorite uh, electronic two-level system with a metastable excited state uh, that is trapped in a, a pole trap, uh, which can be represented as a harmonic oscillator. And we have the condition that the trapping frequency is larger than the uh, uh, width of the excited state here. And uh, then we're in the so-called resolved sideband regime. Uh, we get uh, a, an electronic structure like this, where we have here the electronic ground state and here the electronic excited state um, with the different motional excitations in the uh, harmonic oscillator. Uh, we can then choose to drive different transitions depending on the laser frequency or detuning, we can drive carrier transitions, for example, that do not change the emotional state, but just uh, uh, change the electronic state of the system. By tuning uh, the laser frequency to the blue, uh, we not only go from the electronic state down to up, but also put in a quantum of motion. Whereas if we tune it to the red sideband, as we call it, we remove a quantum of motion doing the same change in the electronic structure. Now, um, we can also do that in um, an ion crystal of uh, um, beryllium and argon 13 plus. Um, and an example is shown here without the carriers. Uh, so you have, we have two motional modes in this case. 
namely the in phase, the so called in phase mode, and the out of phase mode with, uh, that are named for obvious reasons here, um, uh, that have different frequencies uh, that are very distinct in our case. Um, and that's just a, a Doppler cool crystal where you can see the red sideband and the blue sideband uh, simultaneously. And uh, we can then, for example, calculate where argon 12 plus or argon 14 plus would come to lie. And it's very clear, and we can calculate that from just single beryllium axial frequencies. And it's very clear that we could distinguish or we can distinguish between the two uh, the different charge states uh, just looking at the motional spectrum of our uh, two ion crystal here. We can also drive uh, red sideband transitions on the beryllium, um, for example, on, the, uh, uh, on both axial modes, and therefore cool them uh, to the motional, to near the motional ground state, corresponding uh, to a temperature of about three microkelvins or so. And we believe that these are probably the coldest highly charged ions in the entire universe. Um, you see the you see this by the red sidebands uh, vanishing because there's no transition from uh, the motional ground state, um, uh, no red sideband transition from the motional ground state, whereas the blue sidebands here can uh, be nicely excited with almost full co contrast in this case. Okay, now um, now we have um, almost all ingredients to do the quantum logic uh, spectroscopy scheme. Um, let me show you how that works. So we have um, the, we assume to have the argon and the beryllium in the electronic and motional ground states here. We can then apply a spectroscopy pulse on the argon ion that uh, usually um, brings it into a superposition of ground and excited state. Uh, usually after preparing such a superposition, we would project by detecting uh, the internal state. Usually this is done by coupling this state to an auxiliary state um, on a cycling transition, but this we, we cannot do on argon 13 plus because there's no, um, th there's no cycling uh, transition available. Um, we can now um, uh, apply a so-called red sideband pulse that only addresses the excited state electronic population and turns that electronic superposition into a motional superposition of the n equals zero and n equals one uh, state here. And since this is a shared motional mode between beryllium and argon, um, also the beryllium ion is in this um, motional superposition and we can apply the same trick on the beryllium ion, uh, uh, apply a red sideband here and map the motional superposition back into an electronic superposition. And uh, on the beryllium, we have such a cycling transition and uh, can have the remaining ground state population progress and therefore detect on the beryllium what the original um, superposition on the argon after spectroscopy was. Okay. Um, and uh, so we have uh, implemented uh, a sequence similar to this one um, more than uh, a year ago to search for that transition um, in the argon 13 plus because it's a seven hertz um, line width um, in that transition and it was known to 150 gigahertz roughly and so we had to search uh, sort of for a needle in the haystack um, and uh, looking at data like this where you see nothing nothing uh, nothing for hours and then suddenly uh, as a function of the uh, uh, frequency here you see uh, an excitation of the beryllium and then if you tweak up the system um, a few months later you can see a beautifully resolved lines here uh, with Fourier limited line width of 65 hertz for 12 millisecond uh, probe time uh, that give you a statistical resolution of about five hertz. Now I should mention that uh, the spectroscopy laser uh, that we need here to perform this high resolution spectroscopy um, is essentially a clock laser um, based on um, an extended cavity diode laser that is transfer locked uh, to the silicon uh, to a silicon cavity stabilized laser that is operated here at PDB in the group of uh, uh, Uwe Ster in uh, uh, and uh, Eric Benkler, um, and uh, we're very grateful that, uh, to them because without uh, that silicon cavity, you could not do these experiments uh, with, with that uh, resolution. Now, if you sit on resonance here, 
um, we can uh, perform Rabi flopping and uh, you see here um, uh, decay in contrast of the, the Rabi flopping curves and uh, the red shaded area here is essentially a model um, based on defate where the, the, the loss in contrast is given by the excited state lifetime of about uh, 10 milliseconds here. We've also done um, a dedicated uh, lifetime measurement by exciting the highly charged ion into the excited state uh, waiting for uh, uh, different times and then probing the remaining um, uh, excited state uh, population after a certain waiting time. And from this, we get um, a more precise value here. Um, it's slightly below 10 milliseconds in very good agreement within uh, the combined statistical uncertainties with a previous in EBIT measurement uh, in uh, Jose School. Okay, I've been not entirely honest uh, with you because um, Argon is not a two-level system, but rather um, it's um, a, a fine structure uh, system doublet that uh, has yeah, overall six transitions uh, from the ground to the excited state um, that are split by a magnetic field that we apply um, to uh, six components um, that are shifted by uh, about a few megahertz apart. Now, um, to be able to perform spectroscopy on all of them here, we need to prepare uh, the initial ground state here. And uh, we also, uh, optical pumping will not work simply because the excited state lifetime here is on the order of 10 milliseconds and we would have to wait um, way too long uh, to actually pump it into one of these two states. So what we do is we do actually a quantum logic um, uh, assisted uh, initial state preparation um, assuming that the population is distributed over all uh, the available states here and we start off typically uh, to prepare this state here, the, uh, the minus one half in the ground state by uh, applying a red sideband uh, pulse here um, uh, from the excited state and followed by ground state cooling on the beryllium ion. Uh, this way, if we apply this pulse a second time and we're successful already uh, the first time, the population is not transferred back. So we, we only perform coherent operations on the argon ion and the dissipation that you need for optical pumping is provided, provided by ground state cooling on the beryllium ion that makes this, uh, this pumping pulse here irreversible when combined with ground state cooling. Uh, we also uh, do the same trick uh, with this other state here, uh, bring it uh, to the motion or to, to the motion, one motion excited state and electronic ground state uh, and through ground state cooling uh, we're uh, in, in this uh, uh, MJ equals plus one half state. We then transfer that state up on a blue side band here um, uh, to excite uh, the motion here and uh, ground state cooling and then again brings us uh, down here in the, in the emotional ground state and electronic excited state. We then uh, repeat those steps um, with the two remaining uh, 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 states where we have to clear out. And uh, in this last step, uh, you may have seen um, the trick that we use. So if you apply a red sideband here, um, the population that is already in the target state um, is not being touched because we cannot couple to, uh, uh, there's no state that we can couple to uh, down here. By using this pulse scheme uh, with uh, interleaf side band cooling, we can uh, prepare um, the argon 30 plus in this state or in the similar scheme uh, in the other ground state. Now, what we can do now is um, we can uh, perform spectroscopy on all the six transitions, and you can see here a zoomed out version. Uh, of the uh, results and uh, we use the outer lines here um, as uh, calibrator lines for the magnetic field that we see and the dashed lines here are given um, are the Landy uh, G factors um, uh, uh, the prediction these are sort of the, the semi-classical predictions um, of the G factor and you can see they're uh, they're really off um, if we do a full relativistic treatment, a Dirac equation treatment, then we get better agreement with the lines that we measured. If we include electron interactions, we go further away again. 
Um, and then if we do the full QED uh, calculation, um, then we get a very nice uh, agreement with what we uh, actually measure. And if I say we, then it's not actually we, um, but um, it's this group around uh, Shabayev who do G-factor calculations um, with very high precision. And uh, this uh, can be seen as a, a test of QED um, of the excited state. I believe this is the, the most accurately measured excited state G-factor um, of a highly charged ion. Um, so we can compare to uh, our measurements that are shown here in blue to uh, different theoretical uh, predictions. And you can see here uh, that we agree very well with those uh, theory calculations um, and have falsified uh, the, the approach taken here. Um, and we're strictly limited by magnetic field noise here. So if uh, the magnetic field is better under control and our statistics gets better, uh, then we can uh, improve over this measurement even further. Now, I've um, uh, promised you that uh, this will also be about uh, using highly charged ions as an optical clock. And in fact, we've made a first attempt uh, to run the argon 30 bus as an optical clock um, through a frequency comparison to this uh, silicon cavity stabilized laser. And uh, for this, what we do is we do not scan the entire line but rather uh, we pick four transitions here uh, and we probe uh, left and right of the slope of these transitions um, for a few times and then derive an error signal because we're, it, the laser is not centered with respect to the transition frequency here. We get different excitation probabilities when we probe left and right by going equal steps uh, to the left or to the right. And, uh, from that we can derive an error signal and you can see the error signals here um, over as a function of time for uh, these four transitions here. Uh, and you can see that they, um, that they show some noise here and then something uh, happened here. And that's a magnetic field step that we do not know the origin of uh, where this is coming from. Um, however, what, what we do see is that uh, we take the mean of all these levels then uh, we should be free of the linear uh, Zeeman effect here. Um, and if we also uh, remove the linear drift, then we average nicely down uh, following um, a line given by about six times 10 to the minus 14 that agrees very well with the predicted uh, quantum projection noise limit of that measurement. Okay. Now, um, Putting this frequency, or we have not performed an actual frequency measurement because we have not evaluated all uh, systematic shifts, but uh, we have demonstrated extremely high resolution measurements um, uh, here to, uh, to the subhertz level, essentially. Uh, to put that in, into perspective, we can look at the historic evolution of the frequency measurements of this R13 plus line. Um, uh, 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 historic evolution here. There's been recently a new measurement in Sven Sturm's group in a panning trap uh, using laser spectroscopy of a cold uh, argon 13 plus ion that has improved uh, by about an order of magnitude or more uh, the previously best known values. And uh, our result is down here somewhere uh, with a resolution about uh, 0.3 hertz uh, currently that's essentially limited by uh, statistics um, uh, of, of the measurement. And uh, we see no uh, limitation to go uh, uh, down even a few orders of magnitude by um, careful evaluation of all systematic uh, shifts and uh, by collecting more statistics. Now that brings me to um, a summary before I uh, go to the outlook. I, I hope I could show you that uh, uh, we can do now a precision spectroscopy um, on highly charged ions to address fundamental physics. We have demonstrated full quantum optical control over the internal and external states in the highly charged ion. I've demonstrated, I've shown you first coherent laser spectroscopy of a highly charged ion. Um, we've measured the excited state G factors and the lifetime um, of the excited states. Um, and uh, the beautiful thing about the quantum logic spectroscopy scheme is actually that um, we can uh, use the same apparatus and the same logic, beryllium logic ion, to perform spectroscopy now on uh, a whole number of highly charged ions, um, as long as we can sufficiently cool them. 
in our system. Now what's next? Uh, we want to do the first true optical clock and measure um, the isotope shift of this fine structure transition in argon 13 plus um, and perform in particular a full evaluation of systematic uncertainties because that has not been done uh, for highly charged ions uh, before and uh, of a particular, a particular problem that we, we may or may not run into um, is the second order Doppler shift due to residual secular motion um, of the ion because um, there's one of the uh, radial modes in each direction where the beryllium does not move much but the highly charged ion has a large uh, amplitude and um, that mode is very inefficiently cooled on the beryllium because it's not moving very much and there's not, not much energy to be taken out and the cooling rate of that mode is extremely small and so we need to perform temperature measurement on the highly charged ion that we're currently gearing up uh, towards uh, to find out the second order Doppler shift um, um, uh, of the overall system with the highly charged ion. Uh, we then want to, to do absolute frequency measurements by comparing uh, to other clocks at PTB um, and verify isotope shift atomic structure calculations um, uh, that have been performed um, by Vladimir Jochen uh, and Andre uh, Sushikov in, in their group. Now, another thing that I would like to very briefly touch upon um, that is next on our agenda is isotope shift spectroscopy um, to put bounds on the so-called fifth uh, forces. These are um, unknown forces that may uh, couple electrons to neutrons. Um, and to introduce this to you very briefly, let me sh talk about isotope shifts. Um, they arise from overlap of the uh, electronic structure with the, the nucleus and a change in the nuclear charge radius when going from one nucleus to the next and a so-called recoil shift uh, simply because the mass has changed. Now, um, what we don't know very well is the change in the, in the nuclear size and so we can use two transitions, I and J, to eliminate the change in the nuclear structure. And uh, the way to, to do this is to plot this in a so-called King's plot, where you have uh, one, the isotope shift in one transition against the isotope shift in another transition. And typically, those, um, uh, the, the, the transition changes then line up on a line here uh, that is given here. Uh, now, if you have an additional coupling, um, for example, of neutrons to electrons, um, that are, um, for example, uh, with the strength alpha nu physics, <clears throat> then you get an additional term in your King's plot that scales only with the number of neutrons. Um, and then you will no longer have this linear dependency, but rather uh, you will have a nonlinearity that arises uh, from uh, this uh, fifth force. And uh, you can perform an analysis um, when looking into different systems and different transitions, uh, how strong this coupling constant here is, that's the uh, alpha nu physics, um, and uh, the corresponding mediator mass of this uh, additional unknown scalar field, yeah? that's uh, the new physics field. And uh, everything below these lines here is excluded um, by assuming uh, measurements with a, a certain um, uncertainty here. And you can see here uh, that there's a, a large area here that can be excluded by performing high precision uh, spectroscopy, for example, on uh, ytterbium ions. And uh, we believe that by combining um, data uh, from um, uh, neutral, uh, on, from singly charged calcium ions with data uh, from um, um, from highly charged calcium ions, uh, we can actually uh, push these boundaries even further down uh, because what you actually need is a pair of very narrow transitions with a very different electronic character. And we can have that um, uh, by combining uh, the S to D clock transition in singly charged calcium ions and uh, the fine structure transitions in uh, calcium 14 and uh, 15 plus. Now, um, to uh, actually constrain new forces, however, you need to subtract nonlinearities uh, from standard model um, uh, calculations. These are higher order uh, components um, 
that you need to take into account and calculate with high accuracy uh, and subtract them before you can eliminate any of these uh, nonlinearities. And uh, we've done um, uh, very uh, accurate uh, calculations here uh, in this paper. And you can also see a recent experiment using single charge uh, terbium ions by Vladan Vuletic's group um, in this YouTube virtual seminar. Okay, what are our future goals? Uh, we want to do competitive clocks in fundamental physics. For example, um, one of our favorite top candidates currently is palladium, uh, palladium 12 plus. Um, we want to investigate alpha sensitive level crossings that have been uh, talking about earlier. Um, Presidium 9 plus is a potential candidate, uh, but uh, also iridium 17 plus and uh, californium 15 and 17 plus with a preprint that has um, uh, been published uh, today uh, on, the, on the archive and that's a collaboration um, uh, with a number of theorists here. And there's many more uh, highly charged ion species that we can and uh, will uh, investigate in the future in our uh, system. Now before thanking you for your attention, I would like to thank the fantastic team um, that has uh, uh, actually implemented all these results. Um, we have uh, Tobias Leopold and uh, Peter Micke, uh, the first generation of uh, PhD students um, on this project, uh, who have together with Maria Schwarz and Lisa uh, Schmöger uh, set up uh, the initial apparatus, um, then joined um, a few years ago already um, by Stephen King and now uh, by uh, Lukas um, Spies, um, who's the next generation PhD student, and then of course our longtime collaborator, uh, Jose Crespo. And uh, with that, I'm at the end, and I thank you for, you, for your attention. Thanks. <laughs>